Дорогие друзья, мы продолжаем второй день конференции. И наш следующий гость расскажет о своем опыте взаимодействия с ведущими техническими компаниями и поделится ключевыми возможностями искусственного интеллекта. Лекция затронет вопросы оптимизации и ускорения разработки ИИ и интеграции этой технологии в различные сферы жизни. Итак, я очень рад пригласить на эту сцену бывшего технического директора компании «Карим» Стивена Крюгера с темой Разблокирование возможностей искусственного интеллекта уроки с первой линии технологических инноваций. Под ваши аплодисменты. Спасибо. Welcome back. Hope everybody had a bit of coffee. Um, hope the travel pains are not too bad for everybody. And First of all, I hope my South African accent isn't too difficult to understand. So um, thank you all for taking the time out to, to listen to a point of view on AI. Um, I thought it would be interesting just to talk a little bit about my credentials, because um, a lot of the misconceptions and errors I'm going to say during this talk, because remember, AI is like agile. Everybody makes their own journey, and there's no real right or wrong. But um, I thought a little bit of context as to how I started my journey in tech would explain some of the reasons and the points of view that I'm arriving at during this presentation. So um, my background is a Bachelor of Science with um, an odd mix, biochemistry and computer science. I really wanted to be a, a geneticist, but there wasn't much money and it was at that point in time that computers really exploded. So I decided to go into computers. Um, started off with a company called Sun Microsystems. If anybody remembers them, they no longer exist anymore. Fantastic company, invented Java. I worked on the original JavaSoft team with James Gos Gosling. Fantastic um, experience at Sun. Moved on to Xerox Research. I have a strong founding in research. I have a strong amount of patents to my name. And um, I then went on to IBM. Spent nine years with IBM, deep in the heart of research, close to IBM Watson, based out of Dublin and Ireland. Picked up a lot of... Um, research-based skills, um, how to monetize and, and transpose research into actual products, which I think gives me some qualifications to talk about AI, because a lot of it is, is finding out how we apply these new technologies, but at a, at a pace that we'll talk about a little bit later. And then more recently, um, I was head of engineering for Grab, which is a, a um, ride-hailing company based out of Singapore, and then Kareem, uh, another ride-hailing company based out of Dubai. Um, so that's me. Um, now, let's, let's start a little bit further back than ChatGPT. I think everybody's had a look at ChatGPT. But there's some things that got me on the road to computers that really, as a young person, opened my eyes and, and gave me that excitement. If anybody remembers this program called ELISA, it was b invented or written um, back in oh, 1964. And it just allowed a few text prompts to be responded back to the user. And it could run on the hardware back in the day, like 1964. Imagine, there, there wasn't a whole lot of, of processing power. But it was the first time we'd ever seen a computer converse with a human. And we almost thought this thing was going to pass the Turing test, which is a test of whether you can detect that there's a computer on the other side of a screen. Now, it was incredible the first time, the feeling you get the first time you interact with this program, because it would respond in ways that weren't just adding up numbers or generating a set of primes, which is what computers were used to do at that point in time. This is the first time we saw a conversational interface. And obviously with ChatGPT, this is, this is where the real magic is happening today. But the illusion didn't last long. Um, first of all, as a user of Eliza, you'd get through a few prompts and you'd realize what it's actually doing. And it's really just resp responding back to you with the same questions. So you would say, hey, um, my name's Steve. How are you doing today? And I'd say, well, how do you feel about that? And uh, well, I'm cold. And they say, why do you think you're feeling cold? And it's really just throwing back things at you. Not, it's not providing new insights. It's not providing new information. And as an engineer, when you di dive into the actual background of it, you see what it's actually doing. It's decomposing the sentence into its various constituents, pulling out subjects, pulling out objects, and recomposing them as a question and pushing it back to the user. And, and it fits in maybe 10 lines of code, the logic itself. Now, obviously, the strings and the response strings are defined also in the program. It gets a little bit bigger. But fundamentally, it's a very simple program. And it all fits into your head. And the magic just drops away. But you start to get a hint of what, how fantastic computers can be. But this one is really probably about as effective as my wife's therapist. Although my wife's therapist is a lot more expensive, I think we get the same value out of uh, Eliza that we do out of my wife's therapist. Um, but then, spin forward maybe 20 years, and we started seeing the evolution of some computer games. Um, things like Leisure Suit Larry, 
which allowed you to play a game. Now, in those days, games were pretty sequenced. You know, you had a level and you finished the level, you go to the next level. behind the curtain. That's, I think, where we start feeling this, this notion of magic. And this is really something I want to just put a pin in for later on in the presentation when we talk about ChatGPT. Um, and, and it's been really an interesting journey to see these things. Because it's the first time that users really could interact with the storyline. And we've started seeing some fantastical DVD presentations where you can actually change the story based on how you input it. And you can watch the movie multiple ways. So all these ways that people can actually affect the narrative. So, pause on that note. Let's talk about ChatGPT. Back in 2016, the company OpenAI was formed. Now, we've been doing natural language processing forever. Back when I was with IBM, um, it was a very unsexy technology. It was a very unsexy thing, mainly working on search engines or categorization problems, clustering problems. But then, suddenly we saw this increase in compute power and the ability to process many more inputs in parallel. OpenAI Foundation re releases a, a, a groundbreaking paper, I think it's 2017, and we started off with GPT. A couple of years went forward, and we got GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3, and now, now, as you know, GPT-4 and onwards. But this is where we start seeing that exponential uptick around GPT-3 back in November last year. And this is for the first time where these technologies have got to a point that you can actually see the power, you can see the value, you can see the performance. And the adoption, I mean, we know that this is probably one of the fastest adoption of technologies that we've ever seen. Now, we saw personal computing, um, we, we saw things, uh, personal computing, cloud computing, all of these things get some levels of adoption. ChatGPT, in the space of months, was just transforming companies. And this is one of the journeys I'd like to talk a little bit about how it affected some of the companies that I was working for. So. How did it affect the boardroom? I'm obviously in the boardroom. I'm trying to maintain, the, as the CTO, the uh, strategy of the company, making sure that it's efficient, performant, optimized. And suddenly, we see this tool which has promise, incredible promise. Um, we see these reports from consulting companies that are suddenly experts in AI. They're really just reworked people that maybe know a little bit about NLP, natural language processing, or read a few articles and papers and think they're the AI experts, but really nobody is because this technology is so new. But they generate these reports and they show these fantastical numbers. You can get 30% improvements in velocity, 30% improvements in cost, you can fire half your staff, you can do all these amazing things. These things, I mean, Boardroom follows these consultants' reports very closely. Now suddenly this bomb drops on us and now I've got to react to this. And this was the job of, of CTOs like myself for the next you know, a few months trying to figure out what is our strategy? What is our one year, three year, five year strategy going to be? How do we adopt this? And it's not just across tech. This is the problem. AI affects your entire organization, your financial portion, your product portion, your business portion, and your engineering and tech portion. It's, it, there is no corner that AI cannot potentially impact. And the way you impact those organizations is all very different. As a CTO, you're very used to just dealing with engineering, taking product, transforming it, giving it back to business, making sure it runs. Now suddenly you've been told, hey, go and figure out why the finance organization is inefficient. Go find out why there's so many people in finance. Like, do we really need all these people? Why can't AI just, just take over the job? And, and maybe it can, maybe it can't, but there's some work that needs to be done to get to that point. So it was an incredible journey. Now, we, we should probably deep dive on all of them. We don't have time, but I'm gonna deep dive on just one of them. And this is one report by a consulting company whose name shall not be mentioned, where they came up and said, with this technology, you can reduce, you can improve engineering velocity by 30%. Sounds great. 
This was then a job that was assigned to me. Steve, go make this happen. 30% means that we can either do 30% more work or we can do with 30% less engineers. Now think about you know, culling your, your engineering workforce by 30%. That's huge. So one of those two things is true. Hopefully we can just do 30% more work. That's what I'd prefer to do. But if we have to reduce costs, we could probably do a bit of both. So the challenge was go and see, um, you know, get me that 30%. And we had to adjust our KPIs and, and all the promises to make sure we hit this 30%. Now, I'm personally skeptical. 30% sounds like a huge amount of work. And, and, and the promise of these studies is like, hey man, anybody can write a program now. You don't need engineers. You can tell the marketing guy, go write your own program. This is like the level of naivety that we're seeing in the industry. And we know that's not true because there's so much complexity in the engineering life cycle. Anyway, we got the challenge. Go and see what you can do. So we adopted... Um, this was the point in time where we did a lot of engineering work to homogenize engineering. And we had some solid dashboards showing all of our um, metrics for all of the teams that we had and in a very consistent way. So it, it was really at a great point in time that we could start putting together some tests. Um, and we chose a technology from Microsoft, Copilot, which does some code generation. Um, we identified two teams that were fairly similar in nature and said, okay, let's run a side-by-side -side experiment because I, I only trust data, in data we trust. And we applied this co-pilot capability to one of the teams and to one of the teams who said, just go do business as usual. And we ran the experiment for a period of time, a couple of sprints, which is uh, periods of work uh, uh, defined by uh, some weekly cadence. And we looked at the results. How much better did those teams do? And we were looking at things like, how much quicker do they get things from code to production? We were looking at how many features they get to production, various uh, metrics that, that sort of give a hint to engineering velocity. And, and it's not a perfect science. Unfortunately, the results were less than optimal. We were getting nowhere near 30% improvements in velocity. Um, we saw some improvements, absolutely, um, but marginal. You know, sometimes 5%, you, sometimes you really got to squint to see the actual improvements that you're looking for. But nowhere near the, the, the consultant reported promise of 30%. Improvements. Um, so it was a little embarrassing. Um, and so much so that like, I eventually said, look, just run the experiment for a couple of more iterations because maybe we don't have enough data. Maybe the data is too noisy and we'll start seeing an uptick once people start figuring out how the technology works. We ran it a bit longer, exactly the same results. Now, the analysis, obviously, we had to do a retrospective to figure out um, to define the data for their report were trivial problems. They were basically doing like hello world level programming, whereas at the company I work on, it's very high level engineering. It's, it's algorithmic stuff that you really need some computer science background to, to, to get, get a handle on. And these kind of co-pilot technologies, they get all their information and training off things like Stack Exchange. And if you're just doing a Hello World program, it's perfect. You'll see fantastic results. You'll, th you'll see 30%, maybe even more. But when you're doing real engineering, not going to help you so much. Right? Not going to help you so much at all. But it did help us in some avenues. We saw better code documentation because it does some of the grunt work in generating code stubs. We saw better unit test coverage because now you can ask the AI to start generating a whole set of unit test cases, automatically generate documentation. And this has longer term benefits in things that we weren't actually measuring. We weren't measuring, for example, how hard is it for me to take one engineer from this team and let him move to this team, fungibility of engineers. And when the code is better documented, when, when the code is better structured, it's actually a much easier job. So you get some efficiencies there that are not being measured in the study. So long story short, we roll out the technology. It's a fantastic technology, and it's getting better all the time. And even now, the public one that we, weren't, we didn't have access to, it, it is now public, and we're probably seeing probably more 15 to 20% ranges of velocity improvements. But it's still really good for trivial engineering. When you get down to heavy engineering, your mileage will, will vary. Um, so 
Some final thoughts. When you see these studies and you're being beaten on the head by someone to say, please, go and implement this technology, go and get these, these improvements, I think we need to be conscious. Look at the funding behind that consultant. Why are they doing this study? Because quite often there's a line back to the money and there's some kind of a bias or an alignment as to why they're doing that study. They're just selling things like everybody else. Um, but most importantly, get the data. Don't just believe it blindly because your organization is going to adapt differently. The culture, the, the skill level, the problem set that you're working on, your mileage will vary. So make sure that you apply these experiments and run them as experiments. This is the other learning. Always run them as experiments. Try to A-B test, gather the data. It will help, but make sure that you forge your path and your journey. Um, so in summary, on, on some of these like more mundane aspects about AI uh, in the tech org, um, there are challenges getting the boardroom to understand the complexities behind AI adoption. That there's no one size fits all, um, that it's not magic. Right? They see this, this technology as magical, and when there's magic, there's no limits, it's free, it can be applied to everything. Obviously, those things are not true. It takes effort, it takes training, it takes transformation. Um, and the way that you apply it in engineering is going to be very different than the way you apply it in product and the way that you apply it in the business. It, it will be applied everywhere, but it's a very different technology. Like calling it AI is almost as silly as calling it cloud back in the day, right? We know cloud is such a vague word now. We actually actually ask you, what do you mean by cloud? And everybody has a different answer to that question as well. It's still tough to secure investment. You know, we've been in a, a couple of rough years. Um, things have been shaky on the markets. There's been a lot of stuff going on in the world. Um, and the money is, you know, it's not really been an employer's market. Um, it's been tough to fund and get funding for, for these kind of investments. Now, AI is, no mistake, it's an investment you have to make. It's not free, right? Um, the tooling that we're seeing, some of those presentations you saw a little bit earlier, there's fantastic tooling around image processing, about image generation, video generation, text generation. All of these tools, you can get the free version, but like there's, there's going to be this plethora and evolution of the tooling that you just cannot do without, and they cost money, right? They do cost money, and you need investment. So yes, whilst it's going to save you money, may even save you headcount, there is some investment. You need to make sure you secure that investment. Um, and then lastly, I think it's the understanding that these tools and technologies where they're applied to our intranet data, like we've got reams of information, we've got RFCs, going to be when we can actually unleash those bots and consume our internal data and we get real customized AIs. Same thing for when you see support. Support has been a fantastic avenue for AI adoption, but you need it to grind through all of your cases and all of your customer transcripts to be able to start generating that database. And the tooling around customization is only starting to evolve at the scale that enterprise really needs. Um, now, how is it going to impact the workforce? Now, when the personal computer came about, we, had, we heard all these same things. It's going to put everybody out of a job. Computers are going to replace everybody's job. Did it? Um, you know, <laughs> my job description, CTO, didn't even exist in 1986, in 1990, when I was at university, when I was doing my career studies. If someone said to me, Steve, you're going to be a CTO one day, I'd be like, what, what does that mean? Well, uh, what? All of these disciplines, data scientist, data analyst, quality engineer, um, anything you want, chief information security architect, none of these roles existed, right? Did some people get put out of a job? Well, probably the people that were writing ledger accounting entries and didn't learn how to use Calc 123, they probably lost their jobs. You have to adapt. And this is the learning we're going to see with AI adoption. Personal computers created far more jobs than they took. It's freed up people to really apply the power of human creativity. And I believe this is where AI is going to shine as well. It's going to make some do jobs redundant. We'll talk about that in the next few slides as well. But it's going to create a whole new breadth of jobs, and you need to get onto that job train. Um, 
Now, we're already starting to see some of these jobs, um, people writing chat GPT scripts, people using the tooling to be able to do all these cool things. Um, so, you know, when you say AI, it's a very vague definition. It, it, it means many things to many people. It means different things to engineering than it does to product and to business. Um, so you need to try and tease out for these various disciplines, like what does AI mean in the context of your finance organization? Because it's a very different prospect than using Copilot for engineering. It means different things for the marketing teams that are generating multimedia content or generating um, product launches. Each one of those is a discipline and an art in itself. And the poor CTO has to master all of these disciplines. And it's a tough job. It's a tough job because you've got to suddenly learn everything you need to know about the business of finance, about the business of product, about the business of engineering. Um, but there's also this notion of trying to keep everybody calm because there's panic. There's panic and fear when people start seeing you introducing AI and you can see how efficient it is, how powerful it is, and how it might affect your organization. So it's a little bit of run, it's a little bit of steady, and it's trying to keep that balance, which is incredibly challenging. Um, and then also your workforce itself uh, has to be adaptable, um, and you will have to tease out the personalities, just like when we hit COVID, um, not everybody managed to do remote working. For some people, they didn't survive it. They can't, they can't work remotely. They don't work well with human relationships over a, a link. They have to be physical and in person. The, the workforce needs to transform. Same thing with AI. Not everybody's going to take to it. Not everybody's going to be able to use it to improve their own skills, to improve their own efficiencies. Focus on the people that are good at adopting it. It's a very special breed of person, and those are the ones you want to keep close to you. Now, let's deep dive a little bit on something other than engineering, because this is an interesting one. And we saw, I saw some of it just watching from the back there, um, some of the other speakers uh, talking about this. This will be a different angle, though, don't worry. So let's talk about, um, I work for a food delivery company, and I want to launch a new product. Right? Let's say I want to, I was going to use the example of I want to generate uh, a new food item, pizza with pineapple, but I didn't want to offend anybody who, who thinks that that's a, a travesty against God. So let's make it pizza with strawberries, right? I want to launch a product, pizza with strawberries, and um, we need to put together some media content so that I can update my app with menus and marketing material, etc. Now, in the old world, pre-AI, I would have to, first of all, secure funding because we're looking at easy 15 to 20,000 USD to fund such a campaign or such an adoption. I then need to go through a whole bunch of companies that do multimedia production, secure them, book them, vet them. Then they have to book a location, we have to book products, we have to create this thing that we're going to photograph, we hire everybody on site with catering and big lights and screens and cameras, and then it goes to post-production and people go through all the images, etc., etc. I mean, you're looking at a huge investment um, and probably five to six to seven weeks, depending on the size of your campaign. But it's, it's a big investment. What about the post-AI world? Well, you can sit down at your computer, pull up Bing, use Dali, Midjourney, whatever you want, and within 30 seconds, you've got an incredible looking menu item that can go straight onto your app. Now, I'm not saying strawberry on pizza is a great idea, and I used it specifically because otherwise you could think, oh, I just lifted the image from anywhere. But this is, this is what AI gave me in 30 seconds. Now I can tweak it. I can say, put a green background on there. I want more highlighting. I want black and white, whatever you want to do. And it takes seconds. Now think of how many people's jobs I'm transforming or short-circuiting by doing this, right? The cameraman, the lighting guy, the editor, the production company, all of these people are going to have to change the way they do business because this is the future. In 30 seconds, I can launch a new product. I can even automate it. So the impact is real. Um, this is obviously a contrived example to show you the huge level of impact. But it's there. If, it's there if you look for it. Now, who's not to believe that there's going to be companies lining up around the block to say, we're going to do that for you at scale? And, and this is really... The key takeaway from AI is that it's a platform on which we build things. Right now, you don't want to use Bing as your primary uh, you know, use case to generate the content for your menus. You want more of a robust system, um, some more production level capabilities, and probably a focused technology. We saw in some of the earlier presentations where you can do proper image editing and, and selection and expansion and compression, etc. 
those technologies are coming. I mean, this is just the open source freeware version where you get a bunch of credits. That's what this level is. Imagine when it starts being focused on a production house that's now adopted AI as their tooling. So instead of having a team of 50 people, you'd have one consultant walks in for half an hour, generates all your content, I imagine. So the other side of this coin is that, man, I didn't need to be a photographer or a lighting expert or an editing expert or any of these things to create that image of the pizza. It's a pretty acceptable image. It's a terrible menu item, I grant you that. But it's not just about upskilling workers. It's still in the domain of humans. It can be augmented, it can be speed up, it can be made cheaper by AI, but it's still the humans that do that value creation. And this is the trick with AI. It doesn't spontaneously think, oh, let's come up with the pizza with strawberry topping. It's not going to do that. You needed a human to come up with that. But can I now augment that human and bring his ideas to fruition in 30 seconds? Absolutely. That's the trick. It's an augmentative technology. And I think we need to really think about it in this way because then a lot of the fear falls away. Think about music generation. We're starting to see AIs that allow you to generate a song in the style of Snoop Dogg, sung by Elvis, all right? Forget my musical tastes, but it's very real. Now, does it mean it's gonna be good music? Absolutely not. Does it mean that everybody gets the chance to be a good musician? Absolutely. We see people like Billie Eilish and her brother writing hit, you know, worldwide mega hits from their bedroom using studio technology that runs on their laptop. Previously, they'd have to hire studio time. Back in the Beatles days, it was like a group of you know, media moguls and A&R executives whose job it was to really find the artists and the stars and make them. Now, anybody can be a star. What do you need? Talent, right? That has never gone away. The fact that Billie Eilish can write an album in her bedroom is the, because she is talented and she has tools available for her to do that. And this is the real democratization that I think is the fantastic promise of AI. Because now anybody can create an incredible image. Anybody can create art if you've got the idea to bring it to a fresh fruition. Previously, the domain of making a movie, you needed to be Tarantino or Spielberg to have a whole film crew. You had to have $100 million of funding to, to be able to fund your movie creation. Now, we can't do it just yet, but as I easily generated an image of a pizza, imagine I can now generate a movie. Already today, I could use AI is going to bring that to your bedroom. So it's now available to everybody. So think how many Tarantinos we've never discovered. Think of how many Spielbergs we don't know sitting in the audience. You could be an incredible person with an ear for music. You could be the next Mozart or Beethoven. But you've never had the access to the tools and the technology to allow you to create. Now it's democratized. Everybody potentially has the capability to create incredible value. So I, I see it as, as, as giving us more avenues to find these content creators. Incredible promise. In summary, a little CTO cheat sheet, and I'm probably gonna upset some data scientists here. <laughs> My apologies. Data scientists are terrible engineers. This is something I've seen time and time again. They, they're great at data, they're great at understanding how to crunch models, generate models, etc. but what they put forward is generally full of bugs. It's not got m like the, the fundamental engineering requirements that you need for robust deployment. I'll give you an example. Uh, we used to get these, um, the, the product guy would come to me and say, hey, Steve, our Monday morning,
to this world. They don't know how to scale things, they don't know how to do monitoring. More importantly, these data systems are expensive, right? When you run these jobs to crunch your, do your data, generate new models, you are seeing compute costs that, I mean, my, you know, Microsoft and Google and Amazon, these cloud providers that run these huge compute farms, they're loving the amount of money we're spending on that compute. But if I now go to the data team and I say, okay, so how much did that marketing department use of our data lake compute resources? And they look at you with big shiny eyes, like, well, I don't know. I said, like, all those batch jobs you ran last night, how many of them are actually being read by somebody? Well, I don't know. No attribution, no thought for cost. It's just like infinite, like Steve pays the, the budget, right? <laughs> just compute more. So people need to start thinking about these things because they cost a lot of money. And this is why I say data engineers need to come on board with modern engineering practices that we've been doing for the last 10, 20 years. Um, and it's happening, right? But it's a bit of a transformation. When somebody asks to introduce AI, run an A-B test, make sure you, 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 you check the data first. Um, I think we're entering, and probably this is now common knowledge, but I think we're entering a crisis of truth um, with AI. Um, as we see it, more ubiquitous use of AI, we're going to start questioning content. We're going to start questioning where content comes from. Um, we need to develop filters because the amount of content, right, right now it's just images when we start seeing video content being automated. There's going to be so much content. Even now, sometimes you, you read, you're watching these YouTube videos and they get into your stream and, and you can just hear, oh, this is like an AI generated voice. Oh, this means, must be AI content. And you sort of detect it. It's going to get harder to detect. But at some point, you're going to start realizing, oh, man, I wish I had some like, curated content. I wish I had some journalistic content. We thought Wikipedia was a laughable exercise. Community edited facts. Turns out, it's now created this repository of human curated information that is incredibly valuable. We're going to start seeing value being attached to those levels of curated data because of the volume of AI, which is a lot of it is just regurgitated you know, mixes of, of true truth or not. Um, and we also understand that AI isn't always truthful. It sounds very confident, but sometimes what it spits out is not true. And you have to be able to understand the difference. So I do think that the value of human-generated content is going to increase. Where we can add value, it will be more valuable. And finally, I think we have a legitimate use for blockchain. I know I've come a, a, a wide way around that, but man, blockchain is really good at tracking the origins of things. So why not use it to start tracking the source and the origin of truthful articles? Things like Wikipedia, where you can track the, the journey of content. I think we finally have a, a, you know, a, a, a legitimate use for blockchain. Um, so I do, I do think that we, ha we have this crisis of truth around all this content that's going to be created, and we're going to have to develop automated systems to be able to process all of this information. Portable AI is going to also transform our world. Um, it's going to be like steroids for athletes. If you don't have the goggles, if you don't have these augmentative capabilities, you're not going to be able to do your job as well as the next guy. And at the end of the day, we all measured. We all have some performance um, to be accountable for. So it's really key that you adopt this technology. And I think finally, we have a use case for immersive technology and we have a use case for augmentative technology. AI gives you that population that was missing in things like Second Life, that were missing in things like the metaverse. You can now start generating content and, and populations, even simulated, in ways that make them more usable and more real. And, and for the immersive, the Google goggles, the AR type things, I think finally we have a way to instead of just seeing a weather report in the background, we can start conversing because we've always missed this, this human computer interface. And with things like ChatGPT, we have this natural language capability. As soon as we can do the speech recognition and, and, and the text generation, we've closed the loop where you can now get a computer to work and interface at the speed of human conversation, which is where I think these AR systems are going to be incredible. There's a compute problem. Right now, the domain of AI is squarely in the hands of those who can afford it the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts. I think there needs to be some democratization around access to compute. And I think we're going to start seeing things very much like we did, if those of you who remember SETI at home, which was a, um, a network created uh, back in the 90s, 
You'd have a screensaver, you'd run it on all the servers before cloud was invented. You'd have a whole bunch of Spark stations and big servers sitting under your desk. And you'd run these screensavers so that when your computer was idle, it could run compute on some radio um, telescope data looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. We never found any. Turns out it was right in front of us with AI just around the corner. Um, but I think we need to see something like this. I think we need to see some community-funded compute. I think we need to look at edge computing. Um, and I think attention is going to be exchanged for compute. We're going to start seeing areas where I will donate whatever I'm working on, be it a cell phone or a computer, I'll donate some of those cycles as a screensaver or as a background process in exchange for credit and attention, which is going to be the new currency of the future. Um, some bold predictions for the future. You may or may not like them. Things we don't understand are magical. Um, it's really tough to understand and explain to, to people that don't understand the limits of the technology, and it really does become magical. But we need to get comfortable with things that we don't understand. The, the things that we're doing with AI now doesn't fit in everybody's head like it does with the ELISA program. It really is too hard to understand that even the data scientists working on it don't. They're going to start cracking the human communication code. Think how powerful the value of speech is. The Churchills, the Mandelas, the Gandhis that could move populations, that could change sentiments. AI is going to be able to crack that code. They're going to be able to affect and influence people at scale. We're going to see the rise of what I'm going to call a religion, an AI-based religion. When people don't understand things, when people can be moved by things, people are going to detect sentience. And it's going to be a sentience directed at people, individuals. Think how powerful that's going to feel for susceptible people who feel that God has spoken to them. We're going to see the emergence of people that consider this a new truth, a new version of, re of, of a religious reality. And it's not going to be controlled by a church or a clergy. It's going to be incredible and sad. And then lastly, I think we're going to see the rise of super influencers. I think we see people that have this very unique set of skills to be able to communicate to large masses of people, the Jake Pauls, the people that just go on to do these big show boxing matches and just get thousands of eyeballs. Eyeball space, attention is the currency of the future. And when you mix these people with capabilities like AI to supercharge them, they're going to become super influencers that are going to be used by advertisers. They're going to be paid millions of dollars because they can affect the opinions of large amounts of people. And this is going to be really supercharged for them. So that was all I wanted to cover. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has. I know it's a lot to take in. But um, otherwise, please catch me for coffee afterwards. Um, we'd love to interact with anybody. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. As usual, we have many questions, but time for only for one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is a question. What is the future of using AI in creative tasks? What is the future of creator economy and the impact of AI on it? Oh, I, as, I, as I said in one of the earlier slides, I believe the future is that you don't need to have access to huge studios, to huge production facilities, to huge expensive computers and compute farms, we're going to democratize the creative process. Mm -hmm. So you can be an artist at anything. All you need is this AI tooling. You don't need all this investment. So anybody can be a star. Anybody can be a movie director. Anybody can be a rock star. That capability is now fully democratized. Me, like, exam like example, I'm a blogger. So it's, <laughs> it's uh, very good for me. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So, thank you. Thank you very much.